you for joining uh, today's webinar. Uh, our presenter today is Dr. Abby Abrash Walton, and this is the second of uh, two webinars that she's been uh, providing that focus on a model of behavior change. Uh, there is a link, uh, you can, if you want to go back and look at her original one, that outlines the trans theoretical model of behavior change, or the TTM. Today, what we want to do is really focus on how to put that model of behavior change into action. This gets at the core of what we'd like to do here at the Conservation Psychology Institute, which is to look at theory and then say, but how does it make a difference in what we do? So the title of Abby's talk today is facilitating pro-environmental behavior, how to put the trans theoretical model of behavior change into action. And I hope you can say it better than I can, Abby. I think we should just stick with TTM. I agree. All right, next slide, please. Okay, I think there's a little lag time in uh, advancing from my computer. Let's see if we're gonna get there. Here we go. So uh, before we get started with the presentation, uh, we're going to pause for a station break uh, and uh, announce that we're holding uh, an uh, on-site Conservation Psychology Institute in August of this year. It will be held at the St. Louis Zoo in St. Louis, Missouri. And I hope that uh, if this is um, material that interests you and you would like to be in a face-to-face -face setting uh, with uh, scholars and researchers and other practitioners for uh, three or four days in a row, if you'd like to bring a team from your organization, have a chance to dig in, that you'll look into uh, this uh, Conservation Psychology Institute and what it offers. Uh, keep connected with us, make sure you're on the, the list and you'll get uh, updates and information. I probably should have introduced myself earlier. I'm uh, Joy Ackerman, and along with Abby, I co-direct the Center for uh, Conservation Psychology here, the Conservation Psychology Institute, and I'll be doing the overview and introductions, and then helping at the end of the presentation uh, with the audience questions. I think we're gonna use the Q&A box on your screen uh, for questions. So if you have questions at any time during the presentation, you can type them in there, but we'll hold questions until the end. Next slide, please. So uh, Abby uh, Abresh Walton, as I said, serves as co-director of our institute. She's also co-director of Antioch Center for Climate Preparedness and Community Resilience, and she directs our Advocacy for Social Justice and Sustainability Master's Degree Concentration, uh, and is currently the um, program director for our Environmental Studies Master's Program. Abby's got a lot of uh, practical experience as well in sustainability and social justice uh, from human rights advocacy to organizational sustainability. And I'm hoping that she'll incorporate some of that experience in um, moving uh, behavior at the organizational level um, into her uh, talk today and that uh, you'll think about not only uh, change uh, as an goal for your clients or audiences, but think about the organizations that you work within and how you can make change there. Next slide, please. I won't say too much about myself, but uh, here I am. Uh, I teach the conservation psychology course in the master's program and advise some of our doctoral students and self-designed students in environmental study. Uh, my particular interest in relation to conservation psychology has to do with place experience and in particular um, the phenomenology of place experience uh, and affordance theory. Next slide. So uh, everybody should be connected uh, with the audio broadcast when you enter the webinar. Um, you don't need to phone in. Um, if you're having problems, you can use the um, chat section and message Terry, uh, who's got some IT support and can uh, follow up with you on any issues that you're having. Can I just uh, interject quickly, yes, Joy? Please. If anyone's having issues viewing the slideshow, could you let me know? I've had one report of that. I just want to see if that's something that's widespread or, or just an individual issue. Thanks. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I, I have minimized the slide size on my screen, but I'm hoping that doesn't affect anybody else's. I think it's Abby's uh, screen that's being shared. Yeah. All right, so as usual, we're recording this presentation and we'll post it to the Antioch website uh, shortly. So if you're not able to stay with it today or if you want to share it with others uh, or revisit it, uh, you'll be able to find a link to it uh, in the future. And as I said, if you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A tab. Uh, if you scroll down uh, probably to the bottom of your screen, you should see a little toolbar uh, that might have a Q&A or a chat function in. Again, chat for technical support, Q&A for questions about the presentation. And Abby, I think the next slide is, uh, starts off your presentation. It does. Let's, let's advance. Okay, so hi everybody. I'm really happy to be with you today to talk about facilitating pro-environmental behavior. And we're going to focus on using one particular evidence-based model for doing that, the trans-theoretical model of behavior change, or as Joyce said earlier, the TTM, which is a nice shorthand acronym for a really um, fancy academic title of a model. So we're going to call it the TTM. And first, I wanted to start with a simple definition. What is pro-environmental behavior, or PEB? It's behavior that harms the environment as little as possible, or even benefits the environment. That's a definition from Steg and Black from their 2009 article. And what's most exciting, I think, at this stage in our history is that second aspect of the definition benefiting the environment. So think about regenerative agriculture, pollution reduction as examples. Think about all of the, um, the behavior changes that really represent that aspect of pro-environmental behavior, not just reducing harms, but actually benefiting the environment. A second aspect that I want to invite you to consider today is that behavioral change takes place in a context context of social, cultural, political, and economic systems. So think about the sectors, the organizations, the nations, the communities in which the changes that you're most interested in facilitating take place. What's the context from a systems level? And when it comes to tackling some of our most significant environmental challenges, collective action, aggregating individuals' behaviors is really, really critically important. As environmentalist psycho environmental psychologist Paul Stern has noted, small-scale behaviors have environmentally significant impact only in the aggregate when many people independently do the same things. So if you're looking to make big, bold, significant, and sustained change, look for building social movements and social marketing campaigns to shift public policy societal culture, and organizational and corporate policy and practice at large and mid-scale levels. Okay. Hi, Abby. I just had a request if you could speak a little bit louder or closer to your microphone. Sure. Is this better? Yes. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Terry. So let's talk about theory and translating theory to practice. Now, most researchers agree that a theory-driven approach to understanding pro-environmental behavior is needed. And while researchers have surfaced a whole range of effective techniques, as environmental psychologist Wes Schultz has noted, considerable uncertainty exists about when to deploy these respective tools. So we can think about techniques like prompts, commitments, feedback, social norms, incentives, and convenience. So enter the TTM, which offers a really robust theoretical framework for understanding what tools to use and when. And I've got a quote here from the noted social scientist, Kurt Lewin, who wrote more than a half century ago, nothing is as practical as a good theory. So my goal today is to show you how the TTM can be good theory for facilitating pro-environmental behavior. Let me begin with an introduction to the TTM. This may be a refresher for some of you, but let's take a look. So the TTM is a really elegantly simple integrative psychological model for understanding and facilitating behavior change. Jim Prochaska and his colleagues developed the TTM in the 1970s 
by examining how individuals successfully engaged in behavior change related to unhealthy addictive activities, smoking and excessive alcohol consumption, and how they did this without therapeutic intervention. So more than 30 years of empirical research has validated the TTM's measures and constructs in a whole array of contexts. And with more than $60 million of funding from the National Institutes of Health and other sources, this model has been applied to understanding and facilitating change with respect to some 50 individual behaviors. Think about smoking cessation, eating a healthy diet, exercise, medication compliance, even safe sex, as well as to a range of organizational change initiatives. My own research on divesting fossil fuel investments is one example. There are others in the literature focused on preventing bullying in schools or mentoring female university faculty. So focusing on a whole range of outcomes that we would view as pro-environmental and pro-social. We're also using the model here at Antioch with a focus on building local climate preparedness and community resilience here in the Monadnock region of New Hampshire with a climate and health adaptation plan. And research testing the TTM's applicability and validity across cultural contexts is nascent, but encouraging. So there have been studies that have applied this model among culturally diverse populations in Australia, Canada, Finland, different parts of Africa, and the United States, and have found the predicted relationships within the model's constructs. So let's talk about what those four main constructs of this model are. I'm going to give uh, some explanation. So basically, the TTM holds that an individual moves through stages of readiness to engage in a new behavior. That's the construct you see at the top of the screen. And pre-contemplation is that first stage where a person is not engaging in the new desired behavior Maybe the person isn't aware of or interested in the behavior as an option, or maybe resists the behavior or feels a lack of confidence, or as this third construct of self-efficacy that you see at the bottom of the screen suggests, feels a sense that they, they are not able to engage in the behavior. The second stage of readiness is called contemplation, and this is where an individual is considering the new behavior, weighing the pros and the cons, and that's represented by that second construct of the model called decisional balance. That's a fancy way of saying pros and cons. So the third stage is preparation. And it's at that stage in which an individual has committed to engaging in the behavior and is getting ready to do so, preparing to do so. The fourth stage, action, is where the individual is doing that new behavior. And maintenance, the fifth stage, is where the individual has been doing the new behavior for six months or more. So what we're really focusing on in today's webinar is the fourth TTM construct that you see there on the left side of the screen. It's called the processes of change, and there are 10 of them. And these 10 processes of change within the model can be used to facilitate a person's movement through those five stages of readiness, all the way from pre-contemplation to maintenance. And in fact, using TTM-based interventions to move those in pre-contemplation to contemplation has been demonstrated to result in nearly doubling the likelihood of successful behavior change. So I'm going to talk about these 10 change processes in just a bit. But first, let me show you another way of understanding the TTM, this time from a temporal perspective. When does each of these 10 processes of change have the most impact in terms of facilitating movement through stages of readiness to engage in a behavior? Let's take a look. So specific processes tend to support effective movement when provided at a particular stage. So if you look across the top of the screen, you can see the five stages of readiness at the top, all the way from pre-contemplation on the left to maintenance on the right. You can also see in the blue boxes each of the 10 processes of change. So for example, movement from pre-contemplation to contemplation can be best facilitated by consciousness raising activities, dramatic relief, environmental reevaluation, and social liberation. 
And the application of any of these 10 change processes is contingent on the specific behavior and the context in which the change is occurring. There are myriad specific ways in which each of these 10 processes can be implemented. And that's where the real fun and creativity begin. So as I move through describing each of these 10 processes of change in just a few slides, think about what techniques you would use for each given the type of behavior change you want to facilitate. Now, to help you do that, let's first look at the specific behaviors that many of you shared when you registered for today's webinar. Here's a word cloud from the specific behaviors many of you sent in. And some of the most frequently mentioned behaviors were reducing plastic use, reducing waste, landscaping sustainably, conserving water, purchasing sustainably, advocating, composting, and conserving wildlife. So I invite you at this moment to think about the specific behaviors that are of greatest interest and importance to you and to consider how what I share could apply to using the TTM with respect to those behaviors. Let's dive in. In the next set of four slides, I'm going to walk us through the 10 processes of change, the stages for which they're most effective in facilitating readiness to engage in a behavior, and also some sample techniques. I'm also going to suggest some simpler language for naming each of these 10 processes. So here on this screen, we see the four processes of change most effective in facilitating movement from pre-contemplation to contemplation. Let's go through them. Remember, this is for helping people who may be resisting a new behavior, may not be aware of a new behavior, or may feel um, not prepared to engage in that new behavior, helping them to move into thinking, contemplation about the new behavior. So first let's look at consciousness raising. Consciousness raising is about recognizing the need for a change. So increasing awareness about the need for that change via information, personal feedback about a problem behavior, and also about potential solutions. This is really the educational process of change and um, understanding for people, helping them to understand why performing the new behavior is important and why the current behavior is problematic. Now the second process of change, dramatic relief, is really about reacting. It's about experiencing an emotional reaction. So this could mean feeling negative emotions about the current behavior that needs to change and also positive emotions about that new behavior. And Finally, in this block, we have environmental reevaluation. Environmental reevaluation is about understanding the impact of your behavior on others. And that includes, for the purposes of pro environmental behavior, the natural environment and other species who share our planet. So it could be the impact of your behavior on other people, but it could also be your, the impact of your behavior on the natural world. And if you look on the right-hand side of this slide, you see that column with sample techniques. And you'll see that films, videos, books, and direct field experiences are some of the most effective ways to engage people in these processes of change. Now, what I'd like you to do is to think about the specific behavior that you are most interested in facilitating. And I'd like you to think about these first three processes of change that I've just described. And I'd like you to begin to think about how you might uh, develop a technique that would help people to experience those three processes of change. What would it look like? So take a minute now and think about that. And then if you would, just share your examples up in the chat box so we can see the ways that you're thinking about how to raise consciousness, how to facilitate someone or a group of people in experiencing that dramatic relief, or maybe um, 
how you're thinking about a technique that you could use to help a person to engage in environmental reevaluation. Let's take a look uh, at what you've come up with. I'm going to go to the chat box and just take a peek at what kinds of ideas you have for how you could actually implement a technique in this space. And while you're thinking about that and uh, going into the chat box to share, I want to just say that if these kinds of experiences, watching a film, watching a video, reading a powerful book, having a direct personal experience, a field experience, if those things didn't work, then um, we wouldn't have advertising from corporations and we wouldn't have propaganda from governments. Um, governments and corporations have known for a long time that these ways of reaching out um, can be very powerful. Same is true for social change agents. So let's take a look in chat at what you're, what you're thinking about. So we've got one here from Francisco Rodriguez. I'm thinking of actually bringing people to landfills to see the amounts of waste created every day. Anne Klotz writes a booth at a community gathering. And we've got, um, let's see, Bob Dewar says, impacting a municipality group employing past successes. And Kathleen Wheeler writes, thinking about the value of small group, dis small discussion groups talking about the topic behavior. And then we've got some other ones here. Um, Jill writes that showing the film Wasted and then bringing food waste to a compost facility could be a way of engaging people in these processes of change. Um, we've got Science Cafe at a bar as another example or tours of environmental stewardship projects, so some field experiences. These are wonderful examples here. Um, so I love how you're thinking about how you would actually implement uh, some techniques using these initial, these initial processes of change to help people move from pre-contemplation to contemplation. And I'm seeing another one here, Science Cafe where toast, a beer made with waste bread is served. Okay, that's super interesting. Um, and Krista writes, using narrative to help uncover different environmental ethics among individuals and talking about ways to live by those ethics. So that's a good one that we're gonna come to in just a bit. Um, before we leave this discussion about processes of change that can help in those early stages of readiness, let's look at the last one that we have here, which has kind of a funky name. Um, Prochaska and his colleagues call this social liberation. And social liberation is really about empowering individuals through their realization that the world around them is changing. So this is all about realizing how um, the new change behavior, the desired behavior is supported societally realizing that social norms are changing to support that new behavior and that there are resources out there to support you in engaging in that new behavior. That's what social liberation is all about. And if you look on the right hand column, you can see some examples there. So starting at the bottom, maybe it's policy change, both private sector policy change within your organization or public sector policy change, governmental policy change that creates a different social norm, that creates a different um, societal support for the new behavior. You could think about, just as an example, um, again, from the, the public health space, uh, ending uh, smoking in bars and restaurants. That'd be an example of a, of a public policy change. Now, you could also look, moving up that list, at movement organizations. So in my own research, I've looked at fossil fuel divestment, and there is um, an, a wonderful movement organization called Divest Invest, which provides all sorts of resources to individuals and organizations that want to divest their portfolios, their investment portfolios from fossil fuel companies. That'd be an example. Certification programs would be another. So this is what makes it easy for you, right, to know if you're buying 
organically grown food or fair trade food or um, responsibly uh, harvested seafood. You could think about all the certification programs that make it easier for us to realize that other people think this behavior is important too. And lastly, at the top of that list, goods and service companies, think about the whole range of new goods and services that are popping up to support pro-environmental behavior. And I'm sure you can think of a number of examples of that, like infrastructure to support electric vehicles or the proliferation of different kinds of water bottles, reusable water bottles, or um, sites, online sites that facilitate people in ride sharing. Those are some good examples. So those are the four processes of change that relate to helping people get into gear in the change process, moving from pre-contemplation to contemplation. I next want to take us to look at what happens when people are sort of on the cusp of preparation, on the cusp of making that change. And that's the movement from contemplation to preparation. Now, moving from contemplation to preparation includes reevaluating the impact of our current behavior on ourselves and reflecting on our own values our own identities and relevant past experience that we've had. It's about realizing that the change is important to our sense of self, to our happiness, and to our success. And you can see on the right-hand side um, that the techniques for doing this might focus on reflecting on our values, our sense of identity. Who are we? What's our role in the world? And what relevant past experience that we've had that might help us understand the feasibility of engaging in that new behavior or the importance of engaging in that behavior. And I'll just give you the example that for the participants in my research on fossil fuel divestment, a number of them didn't have to think twice about whether divestment made sense. They had been active on their college campuses in the 1970s and 80s in the South African apartheid movement and they understood what divestment meant. They understood how powerful it could be as a choice, as a behavior change. And so when it came to moving to preparation to engage in fossil fuel divestment, they got it. They understood. It was part of their identity and also part of what they understood from relevant past experience. So let's move on to preparation, moving, to action. And there are three processes of change that can be particularly helpful in making this movement from stage three preparation to stage four action. The first is self-liberation, which is a really fancy way of saying committing, committing to the change. Examples of facilitative techniques can include pledges, commitment statements, and participating in challenges, signing up for challenges. The second one here is helping relationships, which is about reaching out to connect with others who are supportive of the change. And you can see here some examples of the types of techniques that can be helpful. Maybe it's becoming active with an advocacy group or an activist group. Maybe it's joining a community of practice or, or creating a community of practice with other people who care about making the same type of change. Maybe it's joining a club that is a supportive structure for um, engaging in that new behavior. Or maybe it's actually a camp that, um, that supports learning about how to engage in that behavior. Helping relationships, really critically important. And this is one of the ways in which the TTM really differs from other change models that are out there in the literature at a theoretical level. It's really emphasizing our embeddedness in social structures. The fact that we are social, a social species and we really need to have these helping relationships with one another to support the kind of changes that we want to see. Now the third process of change here, counter-conditioning, what's that? 
Well, it's basically about replacing new ways of acting for old behaviors. So in terms of, for example, reducing plastics use, here you see on the right-hand side of the screen some examples of counter conditioning or replacing. It might be carrying a canvas shopping bag or using a reusable water bottle or beverage container. Or maybe it's about picking up that metal or bamboo cutlery and making sure that you use that, that you substitute that for um, disposable one-use plastic cutlery that might come with your takeout meal. So again, at this stage, I'd like to take a moment and invite you to share, again, using the chat box, some examples of the types of techniques that you could use for these three processes of change based on that specific behavior change that you're most interested in facilitating. And then we'll take a moment to see what you come up with. So I'm gonna go up into the chat function and take a look at what you're posting. Think about how would you support people in moving from preparation to engage in that pro-environmental behavior that you care about to actually doing that behavior. So this is the first one I'm seeing from Teresa, connecting people who attend our composting presentations in a group on Facebook for mutual support. Yeah, it's so cool how social media and these online platforms can provide that space for us. Jill writes, making meals that are plant forward and locally sourced that are delicious. And Anne writes, a march or a rally. Um, another great example. Anne Hempelman writes, bringing teachers from our environmental literacy um, PD programs together periodically, maybe setting up an online community for them to share ideas, success stories and challenges, and in-person gatherings from time to time. Really great examples. And uh, we've got one here from somebody who, who helped us out with a Conservation Psych Institute. We provided reusable water bottles at one of our first Conservation Psych Institutes right after the campus banned the water bottle. That's right, our Antioch New England campus banned the plastic water bottle. And we put in these great water bottle filling uh, water coolers on campus and um, engaged in other ways of supporting people. Here we've got from Charlotte, getting our zoo guests to take action during their visit with us on site. That's a nice example. Um, somebody posts nature club youth pledges. That would be a good example of commitment of that processes of change, that self-liberation process of change. Uh, providing sustainable products via discounts, bringing people together for demos and workshops, yeah. And we've got one here from Jill, having a clothing exchange so that people don't discard clothes that they don't wear, but exchange them with others. Sustainable fashion, yes, that's a really nice one. I'm just screening through here to see uh, what other ones I may have missed. An opportunity here at the aquarium to make their own reusable shopping bag as part of their commitment. That's from Kathleen at Chavaria. Yep, and We've got taking advantage of New Year's resolutions feelings. Yep, you could think about how to channel that, uh, that commitment that people make at the start of each calendar year and how you could use these three processes of change to help people make good on those commitments. And um, then we've got one here saying, we're currently hosting a plastic film challenge with a company called Trex, where we collect various forms of plastic film, bags, plastic wrap, and other things with a goal of 500 pounds of plastic saved from the landfill. So those are some nice examples. Um, we've also got one here saying using a sustainability app like Jewelbug to promote group challenges and provide rewards for success. Okay, I'm gonna end with that one because that is a perfect segue into the next two processes of change. And these are the last ones. Um, it's a perfect segue because it's, it's focusing that jewel bug app example 
on rewarding new behaviors, right? And that's what you see here uh, with this, this process of change called reinforcement management, or as I've re-termed it, just rewarding, rewarding new behaviors and decreasing rewards for old behaviors. So you've given some good examples, prizes, positive feedback from others, positive results. And I want to emphasize here that this particular process of change, which helps people to not only engage in the new behavior initially, but most importantly, to sustain that behavior over time and to get to maintenance where they're, they're almost habitually engaging in that behavior. It's really important to emphasize here that it doesn't have to be a physical prize, right? It doesn't have to be a monetary prize. And there's research that shows that the impact of those kinds of rewards is really um, transitory and doesn't, doesn't yield sustained behavior change. But look at what some of these other techniques might include. Positive feedback from others, positive results, right? So those feedback loops that tell you that what you're doing is good. So an example of that from my own research would be that the participants in my study whose organizations had divested all of their fossil fuel holdings, they had moved from action into maintenance. One of the things that helped them stay in maintenance and not dive back into investing in fossil fuel companies was the fact that their investment portfolios improved. They actually were doing better without those fossil fuel stocks in their portfolios than they had previously. So that's an example of positive results. Um, positive feedback from others might be, um, you know, what I heard from the participants in my study. They heard from family members, they heard from friends and colleagues, and importantly, because these were all um, leaders of philanthropic organizations, they heard directly from their grantees about how proud people were of their organizations for divesting fossil fuels. So think about those non-monetary, non-material ways of rewarding that behavior change. And then I want to move on to this final uh, process of change from R10, which is stimulus control. And that's about restructuring. So this includes introducing reminders and cues to engage in the new behavior. So policy change at a systems level is a really great example. That's about restructuring the environment, creating what Heberlein in Navigating Environmental Attitudes calls the structural fix. It could, at a very simple level, be something as simple as a cue, like signage. And you know, I know a lot of people like to use post-it notes on the bathroom mirror as a way to provide that cue, to provide that prompt. Um, another example might be automated text messages, like the ones that remind you to exercise. Those are some other good examples. And it sounds like Jewelbug, I'm not familiar with that app, but it could be that Jewelbug, um, which one of our participants on the webinar today posted about, maybe that's the kind of um, tool that you can use with this kind of technique of restructuring. So giving people those reminders and cues to um, engage in the new behaviors, right? Um, so what I'd like you to do now, we've, I've reached the end of describing these 10 processes of change, and I would like for you to take a moment now to consider again the specific ways that you could use these two processes of change to, again, facilitate the sustained behavior that's of importance to you. And you can use that chat box to share an example of a specific technique that would reward or restructure. I'm going to go up and take a look at what you're, what you're posting. Okay, everybody's thinking. Here we go. Here's one. This looks like a good reward. Guests that visit our garden and switch to renewable energy receive a free membership. That's an awesome reward. Yeah. So what other things might you think about 
in helping people once they've gotten to the point of engaging in that behavior to sustain it. Demarcating wetland boundaries. Yep, that is, that's a structural change. Um, here's one, feature individuals and businesses on social media and in news articles to give them positive feedback and media. Absolutely, yep, shine a spotlight on them. Give them that type of reward. Taking the plastic that's recovered in a stream cleanup and making art. Art is a reward. Yeah, I think this is really, um, we were just talking about the connections between art and science and environmental activism. And this is just such a rich place for people to dive in and to be thoughtful. Here's one from Ria, put your canvas bags by the door to restructure your grocery habits. Yeah, for sure, right? So you're restructuring the environment and you're giving yourself that cue as you walk out the door to go to the grocery store, remember your canvas bag. Here's another one, visits by prominent people to the community to praise what's happening in that community. And here's one, take salt buckets away from doors so people aren't tempted to over salt. Um, the Hannaford Grocery Store here in Keene, and I'm sure at their other locations across New England, has signs in the parking lot saying, did you remember your reusable bags? Fantastic. That's an excellent example of the kind of signage, the kind of prompts that are going to help people to sustain that good new behavior. And um, here's one from Bob Dewar. Our program of leave only your footprints reflects directly to the cue to engage as it is subliminal invasive species management project on their property. Oh wait, I'm losing my train here. As it is subliminal messaging tactic that benefits coastal towns resulting in clean beaches. The stickers are on more and more cars locally as we give these away freely, right? So you're, you're getting people to be your advertisers, right? Your social marketers. And um, people are seeing these messages uh, as they move around your community. Um, here's one, we try to get teachers to use big ideas of sustainability routinely in their classrooms. Maybe we could put together a simple game-based logging system where they increase in level as they log examples. Complicated, but could be fun. Absolutely, I am all about gamification, it works. I have a 14 and a half year old who is on her phone a lot. And I think all of us have that experience. Um, to the extent that you can make things fun and gamify, do it. It shouldn't be work to make these behavior changes. It should be fun. It should be enjoyable and rewarding. And let's take a look here. Here's one, we leave big idea posters with teachers after our PDs so they can post them in their classrooms. This can remind teachers to use big ideas of sustainability regularly. Yep, that's right. So an ongoing type of signage. That's terrific. So I think you all get the idea um, about what these two processes of change can look like in practice. And I want to make sure we have enough time for discussion. So I'm going to move on to wrapping up the formal part of my presentation today. And to sum up, maybe what I've got here on the screen resonates for you. We all know the old theory of change. And basically what the old theory of change says is, if people just know enough, they'll change, right? Well, I think all of us know enough from our practice and even from our own personal experiences of trying to change our own behaviors, that it's not quite as simple as providing people with information or telling them what to do. So what does work? Well, I hope what you've taken away from today's presentation is that the TTM offers a much more robust and evidence-based theoretical and applied conceptual model for understanding and facilitating change. So as a recap, according to the TTM, first, People need to be ready to engage in the change. They need to believe that the pros outweigh the cons of making that change. And they need to feel confident about the ability to change. And lastly, there are these 10 
processes of change to help people move through the stages of readiness to engage in the new behavior. So what today's presentation was about was giving you an enhanced understanding about what those 10 processes of change consist of and giving you some initial ideas about how you might apply them to facilitating pro-environmental behavior change. Now, Terry's been recording today's broadcast and you can go back at any time once she's posted this video to our website and you can go back and look at, again, as a refresher, which of these 10 processes of change are most useful in facilitating people based on what stage of readiness they are at in terms of engaging in that new behavior. And I hope you'll find that this is helpful to you in planning your programs and planning your interventions. I wanna thank you for your time today. It's been great to have your participation. And now let's turn to some discussion and get to your questions. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Thanks so, so much, much, Abby. That was great. Um, do you want to leave up that last slide? I think it's important that people know there is a slide for um, the citations, but I, I think it would be great if we could keep in mind the ready and the 10 steps and the pros and cons. Um, so I will be in the Q&A section. If you have a question you would like Abby to answer, then please post it in the Q&A. I'm getting a note that there's an echo, and I'm not sure what to do about that. Uh, maybe well, Joy, that might be because I need to mute myself while you're talking. So I'm just going to go ahead and. That sounds like a great idea, and the problem is fixed. <laughs> uh, you can you can see uh, why we're not uh, the IT people here. Um, okay, so we'll try to get to as many of these questions as we can. Sometimes there are a lot of questions uh, that uh, we can't get to and we try to summarize those and uh, send out responses to them in our follow-up emails. Um, so, um, Abby, I'm going to start with a question uh, that somebody uh, raised in first in the, the chat area and that we've moved over here, and it has to do with the the importance of the values phase. Um, Jennifer's concerned that organizations might try to skip from um, phase one, pre-contemplation to contemplation, right to action, and skip the values phase. Um, can you give us some ideas for engaging um, the values and help us understand the importance of raising the values issue? I, you know, my sense is it, it can be contentious, <laughs> uh, but uh, how, do we, how do we engage it effectively? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I love that question. Um, and I love that she is thinking about this in an organizational context because I think it's a lot easier for us to think about how we engage in self reevaluation, that particular process of change, when we're thinking only about ourselves. Uh, as individuals and making a particular change. And it does become more complicated and more contested when you take this kind of change into an organizational space, or let's be honest, even to, into a political space, right? Um, where you get deeply entrenched uh, different um, positions based on underlying values. And so um, the most successful organizations that I have seen in my research that have been really quite capable of moving from contemplation through preparation to action have had explicit conversations about what their shared organizational values are. And, you know, I think about having uh, a values statement for an organization and how the process of generating that values statement can take people through a reflective, thoughtful process of coming to agreement, coming to some consensus about what their values are. Now, that's nice when that can happen. And obviously, um, it doesn't always happen that way. And sometimes, um, you know, in an, or in an organizational setting, it really takes a strong leader, a champion of that particular change initiative to win the respect of colleagues and to really demonstrate the feasibility and the benefits of a change and to, to bring people through a process. And of course, what you 
what you risk uh, if that's your approach is that once that person is gone, you might lose um, you might lose the underlying commitment uh, to that change. And so that's why I really want to emphasize that tenth process of change, which focuses on stimulus control, which focuses on restructuring the environment, because that will help to sustain the change. So it might be that that restructuring looks like actually writing into policy for the organization that change, that commitment to that change. It might mean that when you're onboarding new people within your organization, you're, you're very intentionally and formally uh, orienting them to the values of the organization, the history of the organization, and why the policies that exist are the policies. Um, so there are these different ways of, you know, making sure in an organizational setting that you're sustaining um, that change. And stimulus control or restructuring is important for that. Thank you, Abby. I, yeah, I want to maybe chime in here a little bit too. And uh, with this, this notion of connecting the behavior to values, uh, one of the wonderful things that Abby did when she was leading our sustainability committee and beginning a, uh, a survey and a plan for uh, reaching uh, carbon neutrality was to make clear and explicit that this was about social justice and sustainability. Those two were always linked. Uh, recently, one of our graduates has published uh, some of her dissertation work on the concept of disposable plastics, but she links the sort of our disposable culture to uh, care for um, how it might reflect a larger attitude that some people are disposable. So really linking that, what might be sidelined as purely environmental behavior to a larger value system or a larger identity about um, uh, how we value health, uh, how we value our children, how we value our communities. So uh, Abby, the next question has to do with different types of behavior. Does the theory change if the behavior is a one-time major change, but then would require a different behavior in order to maintain? So the example given is planting a forest, then engaging in forest management. My private sector uh, behavior would be starting a worm composting bin, which was a, you know, took a lot of effort compared to maintaining the use of that bin. Yeah, I, I really appreciate both of those examples and the question. And this is, you know, I think everybody who is, is joining us today can imagine or remember from their own experience um, behavior changes that were temporary, you know, that, that were not sustained. And that's really where um, helping people through those last two processes of change to maintain the behavior is so important. So thinking about reinforcement management, the different types of rewards, thinking about, again, stimulus control, restructuring the environment um, in multiple ways to maintain the change is so important. And even though, you know, to date the research, most of it has, has sort of limited the role of that helping relationships process of change to an earlier um, stage progression. In my own research, um, helping relationships were important across all of the stages of readiness to engage in change. So, you know, thinking about um, the examples that, that the participant raised about managing that forest, you know, there it's a question of, um, really thinking about restructuring the environment so that there's clarity about what good forest management entails and um, being very thoughtful about who the other people are who are decision makers in ensuring that that forest is managed in the way that, that people have agreed it should be and maintaining those, those helping relationships. Um, so, and with the worm composting bin, uh, again, you know, just thinking about the kinds of helping relationships that um, you might develop for yourself 
or find the resources that are out there, the people who also care about that particular type of behavior, um, the stimulus control, the restructuring of the environment, that those would be the, the processes of change that I think would be most relevant for thinking about how to, how to sustain that over time. And I do want to say at this stage that this is not a linear model. And um, people who use this TTM model don't think of it as being lockstep um, movement from stage one pre-contemplation all the way through to um, stage five maintenance. It's important to understand that this is really, it, you could visualize it much more effectively as a spiral. And you can move through that spiral moving up as you sort of move from pre-contemplation to contemplation, but then maybe you cycle back to pre-contemplation. Um, maybe you then next time get as far as preparation, but you don't, um, you don't manage to move to action. So there are different ways of, of what I want to emphasize here is that it's not, um, it's not as simple as linearly moving through these stages. It's really important to remember that people can relapse. People can take two steps forward and one step back in a change process. And that's precisely why I'm emphasizing these 10 techniques for facilitating the behavior change, because um, this is this is a temporal process. It's not just one and done, right? So the idea here with these techniques is to be thoughtful about what can really be helpful in, in people achieving action, achieving maintenance, and then remaining in maintenance once they've once they've gotten there. And also being realistic about the fact that we're humans and um, only about 20% of us in any given population are going to move quite clearly and linearly through the process. Great. So I'm still working on my behavior of unmuting, but um, I guess I need some prompts for that. Um, thank you, Abby. I'm sort of scanning through the questions that are coming up and uh, hoping to get at different topics as well as different uh, questioners. Um, Bill's concerned that the focus has been on people who are ready or nearly ready to change. And can you say a little bit more about uh, those who are resistant to change, uh, sh should we just focus on um, kind of the, the easy get, the low-hanging fruit, or uh, is there uh, a role or a strategy for really working with people who are in pre-contemplation? Yeah, there absolutely is um, strategy for working with folks who are in pre-contemplation, and um, and I want to say, I mean, maybe we should do a webinar in the future where we really talk about how to, how to assess where someone is or where a group of people are with respect to stages of readiness to change. And at some level, it's a judgment call. It's a strategy call on your part. Do you, do you need those folks um, who are in pre-contemplation? Uh, are they the most important people who you need to support? Or could you begin by working with people who are in contemplation or preparation or even in action. So really assessing um, what the specific behavior change is, who the population um, are that you're, you're wanting to support and what the context is is super important. But thinking about how to engage with pre-contemplation, one of the things I love about the TTM is that this is a very, um, socially, uh, socially, what's the word I want to use? Um, friendly model. Um, it's not about shaming people. It's not about punishing people who, who don't comply. It's about understanding that people, all of us are always going to be at different stages of readiness with respect to a change. And it's, it provides a respectful um, model with these 10 techniques for facilitating change to meet people where they are and to develop techniques that can help, as you saw in that earlier slide, help people to understand um, why the current behavior is a problem, what a solution behavior looks like, what the benefits of that solution behavior might be, what the feasibility 
um, or um, effectiveness of engaging in that behavior might be and why, why they really um, should consider it and move into contemplation. So absolutely, there are very effective techniques for helping people to move out of pre-contemplation. And at the same time, um, especially when you're thinking about an organizational change, it's really important to remember that the people who might resist the change the most are resisting it because they care so very deeply about the organization. It's not that they're necessarily contrarians or they're just trying to be obstinate or they're trying to be difficult. It's because they take very seriously the organization or um, other form of, of um, entity that, that they're part of and they care about it. And so, um, working with people who are in pre-contemplation from a resistance standpoint is super important because you really need to surface what the objections are that people have to making that change. And you might be surprised and you might learn a whole lot about what the real source of that resistance is. And quite often what you can learn through that process is that the change that you're proposing might be really good in some ways, but could be even better if it takes into consideration what the real causes of resistance are, are pointing to. Thank you, Abby, that's great. We had a few more questions kind of on the same lines, uh, sort of uh, which phase seems to be the hardest shift for people to make? Um, how do we determine what level of readiness people are at? Do we need to have activities to promote movement forward through all 10 steps um, at all times? Yeah, so um, don't you love it when people just give you this response? It depends, right? <laughs> But it does depend. It depends on what the behavior is. It depends on who the people are. It depends on what the context is, um, what the real urgency is in terms of making that change. So, um, you know, it, you can just think about this almost in terms of inertia, right? A body in motion stays in motion. The body at rest stays at rest. And moving people um, from pre-contemplation to contemplation might be the hardest part of your job. Um, but on the other hand, helping people who are already in action, who are already doing the behavior to persist and to maintain that behavior, that might be the more challenging thing to do. It really depends on what the behavior is and who, who is doing it. And so um, really there's an art as well as a science to engaging in this work and selecting from those 10 general processes, um, the ones that are going to be most effective, um, given where your folks are in terms of making that change. That's really helpful, uh, Abby. I think uh, I'm uh, thinking of material you might bring to another webinar, which has to do with how you uh, determined how ready people were in this building to make a change to more sustainable uh, purchasing and by doing surveys about what they would find most helpful, um, it really gave us some leverage for making structural change. Um, so some of the questions are, and this will have to be our last one, I think, um, although I'm willing to be overridden by that, but they, they have to do with um, uh, how do we make the right thing easier to do? And I think that ties into Teresa's question on how do you see community-based social marketing tying in with the TTM? And both of these to me seem to speak to really finding out about our audience. What really are the barriers? Are they values barriers? Are they doability barriers? Barriers, sort of what is it that is um, keeping people from uh, moving forward? And I, I know I'm a little frustrated in an organization I'm in where nobody was signing up to provide the refreshments. And so the leadership decided, well, we just need a new kind of coffee maker. That'll help. So they invested in this new coffee maker. And I'm thinking, no, I think people aren't signing up to do this because all the signups are online and people really need to be individually asked. So anyway, we'll see how that plays out. Yeah, and, and my prediction, Joy, is that you assessed it correctly and it's going to be those one-to-one -one asks that are really going to move the needle in getting people to, to engage in the way that leadership is hoping they will. Um, 
So I would love to come back and do another one of these webinars. Maybe we'll build it into the St. Louis um, CPI, the Consyc Institute there, to really look at how do you assess where people are in terms of readiness to engage in that behavior. And I, I would love to share um, the, the study that I did of responsible purchasing here in compliance with our responsible purchasing policy. Um, I'm writing a, that up now for um, an article. There's gonna be a special issue of the Journal of Social Issues focusing on the psychology of sustainable consumption. So um, give me some time to finish the article and then I would love to come back and, um, and share that research. As a, as a good case study, and also a way of understanding from a methods place how you actually put this um, TTM into action. All right, uh, Abby, could you take us to the closing slides then? And for those of you whose questions didn't get answered, we will uh, look at them all. And uh, often we send out a PDF of, uh, that includes the slides, that includes additional questions and answers to, uh, and perhaps resources. And as Abby said, stay tuned for uh, another webinar on this topic coming up that helps uh, to deepen our uh, knowledge and tools to put it to use. Uh, you should get an email uh, from us within, uh, with a link to that webinar recording. Uh, it will also have the slides. And uh, if you fill out our survey today, uh, then uh, fill it out. We appreciate your feedback. And you can also uh, add additional comments on there and questions about topics that you'd like to see us cover or resources that you'd like to have. Next slide, please. So our next webinar is going to be on Tuesday, March 19th uh, from 12 to 1. Our presenter is Dr. Thomas Doherty, who is an uh, eco-psychologist from Portland, Oregon. And uh, Thomas focuses on uh, really integrating nature uh, and practice into mental health and well-being, how to keep uh, environmental sustainers sustained. And uh, I think you'll enjoy his work. Next slide, please. And uh, some of you wanted a little bit more information about the Conservation Psychology Institute. Uh, the format of an institute usually starts, uh, I think this one will start on a Tuesday evening and run through a Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. It will involve a, a small group of people, between 20 and 45 people, uh, on site at the zoo, in classrooms, and in the field. Uh, where you will have both interactive lecture and small group opportunities to engage in applying what you learn. Uh, a schedule of uh, more uh, specific topics and information uh, will be available at the website. And um, uh, I look forward to having your expressions of interest in that and to, uh, to see you there. Uh, anything else? Do we have one more slide? I I guess that's it. All right. So hope to see you again next, uh, well, not quite next month, in March. And again, please feel free to uh, contact us if you have other questions, uh, need other resources, or interested in other webinar topics, or if you'd like to host a Conservation Psychology Institute at your organization. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, Abby. My pleasure. Thank you, Joy.